call the uh, meeting to uh, to order. Uh, pursuant to uh, Standing Order 108-2, uh, we'll continue our study of consumer protection and oversight in relation to uh, Schedule One banks. Uh, and today we have uh, with us as uh, individual as individuals uh, Sally Watson and. Uh, uh, members have copies of uh, her remarks. They have been translated, uh, and we have Mr. Alford, uh, who's uh, who has remarks, but they're not to committee members because we don't have them translated as yet. And on the phone, uh, we from the uh, Small Investor Protection Association, we have Stan Buell, uh, and he's by uh, by by phone. Are you there, Stan? He's not. He'll say hello when he uh, when he uh, when he comes on. So the floor is uh, yours. I guess we'll start with you, uh, Mr. Miss Watson. And I believe some members have told you how the procedure is. You'll uh, have an opening statement, and then we'll go uh, back and forth with uh, with questions. So welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. I would like to thank the chair for providing me with this opportunity to speak on such an important matter. I was first hired by the CIBC in 1974 as a teller in Hamilton, Ontario. I was there for one year before I accepted a position at Scotiabank in 1975, also as a teller. Tellers were historically paid by all banks at a bit above minimum wage. Let it be clear that I only worked for these two banks, but had so many acquaintances throughout the bank system that I can comfortably state that the practices we are discussing here were pervasive throughout the, all the major banks. I was an excellent teller, I never had a single unresolved difference, and my customers, who were also my neighbors, found me friendly and approachable. I eventually became the head teller, the commercial teller, and the bulk teller. I was then moved to the back office as an accounting clerk. The bank justified paying back office staff less money because they had no customer contact, making it a less stressful job. For the first four years of my employment, I was classified as part-time, even though I worked 40 hours per week. At that time, the branch that I worked in was open extended hours, which meant until 8 p.m. on Thursdays and 6 p.m. on Fridays. I started at 9 every day and worked all extended hours. No yeah. overtime was ever paid. There was no such thing. We were uh, Ms. Watson, I'll just cut in for a minute. I believe uh, Mr. Buell uh, just came on the phone. So just to tell you, Mr. Buell, we can, uh, we can hear you. I hope you can hear us. We have two individual witnesses uh, first, and then we'll turn to you, and all the members will be able to hear you. Very good. I hear you loud and clear. Good. Thank you, uh, Stan. Uh, Miss Watson, go ahead. Great. We were given a supper allowance of $5. I received no benefits, as I was classified as part-time. After several years of attempting to be reclassified as full-time, I finally went to the Federal Labor Board, who contacted my manager, and I was subsequently made full-time. I was never quite sure if it was worth it, as I was labeled a troublemaker from that point on. It has all been standard practice at all banks for the staff to volunteer to make RSP calls during the months of January and February. Anyone who didn't offer to stay after hours and make these calls faced having a note put in their personnel file stating that they were not a team player. Payment for making these calls three times a week until 8 p.m. was a slice of pizza eaten at your desk and a can of pop. I remained working at the same branch for 20 years. At that time, we were totally convinced that we owed the bank for giving us employment, and we were unlikely to ever get jobs anywhere else. I suppose it is almost a case of Stockholm Syndrome, where you become convinced your very existence relies on the people who control you. I eventually transferred to the Ontario, Ontario Central Accounting Unit in downtown Hamilton to escape an abusive supervisor, and things began to improve. For one thing, there were no sales goals. Sales goals were an insidious thing for all branch employees. The number of cross-sells, upsells, and referrals for large credit products that were required in order to get an acceptable rating on your annual performance report was staggering. It simply wasn't attainable in the course of normal working hours. Hence, more unpaid overtime. But that's another story. I congratulate the women who came forward from both the CIBC and Scotiabank and successfully pursued class action lawsuits that at least resulted in some of their colleagues getting the lost wages that they deserved. 
Sadly, hundreds of employees were not in those numbers of the defined class, and they got left behind, will likely never be compensated for all the hours that they worked. The pressure to achieve sales goals did more than coerce staff into working for nothing. It also urged them to sell products to customers that they had no need for, raising credit card limits, urging people to take out car loans, RSP loans, open a line of credit, or be approved for overdraft protection were commonplace. The one that disturbed me the most was approving people for much larger mortgages than they could afford. Anything to raise the profit of the bank, whether the consumer could afford the product or not. I can clearly remember the day when my husband and I went to get a pre-approved mortgage from the bank so that we could go house hunting. I was appalled at the amount they were willing to lend, even though we had understated my husband's income. I saw the big smile on my husband's face and when we got outside, gave him the bad news that we could only actually handle a mortgage half that size and would have, he would have to lower his expectations. I also told him that there were going to be a lot of rough times ahead for a lot of people that were overburdening themselves with huge mortgages they might not be able to handle. And that was 1999. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wat Ms. Watson. Uh, turning to uh, Mr. Alford, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, sir. I'm grateful for this committee and the opportunity to allow my voice to be heard. I began working in the financial industry in Canada in 1984, and by the 1990s, most of the financial firms were purchased by the big banks. I'm sorry, most of the investment firms in Canada were purchased by the big banks. I worked inside those financial firms for 20 years, and I participated in one of the first investment offices to be housed inside a Royal Bank branch at that time. I'm well versed in the sales practices and incentives for employees and the codes of conducts and regulatory systems. Before I get into my presentation, I must first tell you why that I believe this topic is of utmost importance to Canadians and could be important to listeners. The reason that this topic is, is important is that I believe that systemic cheating and shortchanging of Canadians by financial institutions cost Canada as much money as the cost of all criminal acts in the country combined. Those are criminal acts measured by the Government of Canada and Statistics Canada. If that fact is true, or if that belief of mine were to be true, then the topic that you are charged with hearing is far more important to Canada than we can ever imagine. To begin, point number one, that nobody in the financial industry that I knew went into that business to, with the intention to harm clients or to violate them financially. Point number two, I know that I did not go into the financial industry in order to do financial harm to my clients, nor did I expect that to be the case. I also know that I did not join a top Canadian financial institution with the understanding that they would require me to harm my clients financially in any way. I did not enter the field with the understanding that any bank would do harm to me as an employee if I refused to do harm to my clients financially. If I refused to step outside the rules which required that I deal honestly, fairly and in good faith with my clients, I did not expect to be harmed by my bank if I refused to do that. Lastly, if I could get around the first two, I did not enter the financial industry in Canada to stand silently by like a bystander while 80, 70 or 80 percent of my sales associates made themselves richer by harming their clients financially. And yet all those things take place, took place and take place today in the financial industry to make financial firms richer. They take place in secret and invisible to the radar of all current attempts to regulate and protect Canadians from these harms. I've worked in a bank, bran bank branch environment, however my background was one of the investment industry side. Starting in the early 1990s, Canada's largest banks purchased 90% of the investment brokerage firms in the country. The banking industry thus also owns the largest portion of the investment industry in Canada. That's important because my truck driver friend in Tabor tells me that we're not talking about rich people, we're talking about every single person who works, saves, and hopes to invest to retire someday, every person in Canada. When my firm was taken over, we had 1,000 investment salespersons. They were legally licensed as salesperson under the law up until 2009. 
And the bank had between 12 and 15,000 account managers. I don't know what their license was. That's a different uh, area. What I've discovered is the bank objective was to force those 12 to 15,000 account managers to step out of their old role of helping people and become licensed as salespersons. And to begin the process of pushing clients into bank investment products, the profits could soar if we could get all of our clients to go into bank investment products. In 2007, the University of Trotman, Toronto Rotman School of Business did pension studies led by Canada's foremost expert, Dr. Keith Ambestier. They found that clever marketing and not necessarily good financial advice was gouging Canadians, not serving Canadians, I'm talking about the gouge only, by two, $25 billion a year. That was in 2007. $25 billion was the benefit to the dealers and the harm to investors at that time. His calculation was that 3.8% was how much more retail investors were paying for financial products than they needed to be paying when compared to professional investors or institutions. If I update Dr. Ambestier's numbers to 2017, I can easily estimate 40 to $50 billion per year in financial harm to investors. This number is from the abuse of market dominance that allows banks and their dealers to control the market to the extent that they can deceive and harm Canadians. I repeat, I'm not talking about a fair fee, a 1% fee to manage money. I'm talking about an overcharge or an excessive fee that clients know nothing about that they're getting value, I'm sorry, they're getting added costs without added value. This uh, mutual funds example from the Rotman School of Business is only on one investment product, mutual funds, and one marketing tactic out of hundreds. There are easily another dozen, dozen methods of harming Canadians that allow the financial harm to Canada to exceed the harm from all other crime in the land. A study on demonstrating that is underway and the results so far support the premise. Your first question as a committee might be, but Larry, shouldn't our regulators require Canadian financial institutions to deal only with clients in a manner which is fair, honest, and good faith? That's what they'll tell you next week when they come here. And the answer to that is obviously yes, it should. But the result is no, it doesn't. Our regulators should require financial institutions to deal fairly, honestly, and in good faith as is required by rules, the laws and the codes of conduct of every industry member who will speak to you. The answer that it doesn't, the result is that I have not yet met a regulator who is not picked and paid by the very financial institutions who pay the regulators' salaries. The regulators have their hands on the wheel and are paid by the industry. They are charged with policing. Paid by the industry, they are charged with policing. As no one can serve two masters, they have a record of ignoring, ignoring the public interest when their job security is put at stake. Regulators' job security is every bit put at stake as bank employees' job security can be. And regula regulatory employees thus face double ethical binds in a similar fashion to the ethical binds placed, double binds placed on bank employees or financial system employees. Regulatory capture by paychecks, which are only funded by those who are being regulated, is a very highly unskillful and suspect system. It is not professional. It almost seems designed to fail, and if so, then it is a huge success to the industry by being a failure to Canadian investors. Yes, uh, if I if I could, and I really hate to do this, but I know you're only about uh, halfway through, and we try and hold the comments to five minutes, and we're at eight, so if you could highlight you. Uh, the problem is we'll, uh, I'll speed we'll, it up we'll here, need uh, time to get to questions, so okay. if you can sum up as quickly as you can, but don't miss your key points. I'll, I'll sum up with a quote from uh, Bank of Canada Governor David Dodge, former Bank of Canada 2005 Governor David Dodge, and I quote, there is a perception in international financial circuits that Canadian markets are the Wild West, and it hurts Canadian companies when they try to raise money abroad. 
This is a very common refrain that we hear when we visit markets in New York or in Boston and London or in Europe. A perception that somehow this is kind of a little bit more like a Wild West up here in terms of the degree to which rules and regulations are enforced. I'll only add to that with a thank you for listening to me. The Wild West applies to the regulatory system of retail investors and affecting retail investors much to the detriment of society. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Larry. And there is a, another point you might want to draw out later in answer to a question, and that relates to your point on investment to victims. Uh, you can think about that in the meantime. So uh, turning to the phone, uh, Mr. Buell, uh, if you want to, uh, and I think I gave the name of the group, yes. Uh, Mr. Buell's with the Small Investor Protection Association. Uh, Mr. Buell, the floor is yours, and try and hold it to about uh, five, six minutes if you could. Good afternoon. I will be brief. Uh, SIPA, or the Small Investor Protection Association, is incorporated as a national nonprofit organization, and we are fortunate to have the support of many volunteers that devote time and energy to our work as we try to raise awareness among Canadians. Three decades ago, I lost my life savings due to fraud and wrongdoing by a major financial institution. Like most Canadians, I trusted them to look after my best interests. The impact was devastating and life-altering. It was another 10 years before I suspected anything wrong was done. I investigated for six months. What I found was distressing. It was not unusual nor was it common, or it was commonplace. I found that my advisor had been disciplined and fined several times, and I tra tracked down a half dozen of his victims. All had received the same treatment. He had been doing the same things for 15 years. One of his victims had died during the legal process. How, who knows how many were victimized? When I spoke with the widow Shirley, I knew I must do something to try to help other Canadians. She is the reason SEPA was founded in 1998. Her husband, Ed Shirley, had operated a family business for 25 years. He contracted terminal cancer. The business and the house were sold. The proceeds and all of their savings were placed in the care of this advisor. About a million dollars in total. She trusted him. It seemed enough to support a senior widow. Three years later, she was called into their office to hear them explain that her money was gone. They were sorry, but they could do nothing. Since founding SEPA, I've talked with many hundreds of victims. Their stories are all quite similar. Lives are ruined, health is harmed, families are broken up. Many talk of suicide, and some do. The CBC Go Public TV and radio programs over the last two months have raised public awareness more than SEPA has been able to in two decades. There is a new awareness that is building. Any government inquiry must talk to the victims to hear the truth. It is not bank teller upselling or being pushed to meet sales targets that is the major issue, but it is indicative of the culture and attitude of the financial institutions that extends to their financial advisors that are motivated by sales targets and the need to generate commission to satisfy the commission grid. The soothing words of codes of ethics and regulators' rules and guidelines to do little to save Canadians from harm. Self-regulation in this industry does little to protect Canadian consumers. Rather, it adds to the deception that encourages Canadians to place their trust in the financial institutions. SEPA has issued a series of reports that reveal some of the facets of strategic insidious deception. Members of the committee are urged to peruse some of these reports. However, it is most important that you talk with many witnesses. The CBC Go Public has heard from thousands. Then try to reconcile what you are hearing from the industry and what you will hear from Canadian citizens. Recognizing that there are provincial and federal regulatory jurisdictions, we believe it is essential that the Government of Canada establish a National Consumer Protection Authority that will work with all the regulators but have the power to order investigations 
and to pay restitution when it's found to be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Buell, and uh, just, uh, I, know, I don't know if you can see us in your unit or not, but uh, just so you know the setup, uh, there is uh, five members of the uh, governing party here, uh, three members of the official opposition, one member of the uh, a third party, uh, and uh, we will rotate uh, on questions, just so you, uh, you know. Uh, starting to uh, question seven-minute rounds, uh, Mr. Ouellette. Well, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for coming here today. I very much appreciate it. I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit, uh, Mr. Elford, you mentioned uh, payment, of, payment of regulators. Regulators had their hand on the wheel. Uh, could you actually say what regulators uh, are being paid by Schedule 1 banks? I was just uh, a little unclear on that. And, and how does that work then? Thank you. Uh, I, I have to admit that my experience was totally on the investment side of the banking industry, and as a result, I was licensed under the Canadian Securities Administrators, uh, which is the umbrella organization of 13 provincial and territory securities commissions. And those securities commissions are not government funded, they're funded by fees and payments by the investment industry. They're selected, by member, selected from members of the investment industry, and their payments, their salaries go as high as $700,000 at some of the various securities commissions across the country. Beneath the Canadian Securities Administration, there is nothing left except for self-regulatory bodies, and those are fully industry, self-paid, self-protected bodies, in my view. They provide a pretense of public protection, uh, which is more, uh, more of a facade in experience. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering, you'd also mentioned uh, the separation between banks and investment companies. Why, why is that important? Why, why do we need a separation between banks and investment companies? Uh, I, I don't know necessarily that we need a separation, but we need independent protection, independent eyesight on the behaviors that banks uh, undertake with regard to investment customers because we're dealing with Canadians' life savings. And if the professor at the University of Toronto's 3.8% harvest or additional gouge of investor savings is correct. We have now, Canadians have a trillion dollars in mutual funds. If the banks are allowed to take 3.8% from that, or even two, if the numbers were too high, 2% cuts every Canadian's retirement in half. 2% compounded over a 35 year period cuts every Canadian's lifestyle in half during retirement. And Dr. Ambashir's number said that mutual fund costs in 2007 were 3.8% higher. It's, a, it's, a, it's draining society at, at the retirement level. And uh, I have a question uh, both for uh, Mr. Buell and uh, Ms. Watson. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Buell, you had talked about culture, and so, you know, we've heard in the media about employees who sign uh, uh, people for services they don't really need, perhaps a little extra banking accounts. But you know, those are minor fees, you know, $3 here, $3 there, maybe $30. But what is the impact on the, on the culture uh, within, within an institution, in your opinion? What, what type of culture does that create in the long term? And then what risks are there for that culture and for, I guess, for Canadian society if, uh, if people aren't really following uh, these regulations and rules? In, in the spirit, uh, in, in a good way. For me? That's for you and for uh, for Stan as well. Watson and then turn to Mr. Buell. Okay, now if I understand you, um, what is the question exactly, like in a nutshell, you want me to know, do you want me to tell you how that affects the employees, that they have to sell all these products to scoop all these extra service charges? Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. What, what's the impact on their overall, uh, not, not their health, but what's the, if, if you have to sell a product day in and day out and you're just skirting the law a little bit, you know, you sign something up for someone, no one can really verify it. What, what type of culture does that create within an institution or within, uh, within a company? Well, it's not great because of this huge competitive thing. Um, you, everybody's trying to grab a new customer whenever they come in the door. You're forced to sell products to people you, you see the same customers every day, day in and day out. And how many times can you sell that one person 
another product. There's just, you just run out of things to sell them. And when you do, you're in big trouble. Because if you don't meet those sales goals of selling X number of accounts per month or per week, or sometimes even per day, you're in big trouble. You get um, things put in your file saying that you're not adequate, you're not up to the job, you're not a team member. And eventually, uh, when it comes time for your performance appraisal to be written, you get absolutely no raise. I mean, there is nothing. And if you get no raise two or three times in a row, the next thing is the door. So it creates a lot of tension and a lot of pressure. I myself, when I was in my very early bank days, because I worked for Scotia Bank 40 years ago, um, I changed the coding on 100 bank accounts to be Scotia, what they called Scotia 59er accounts, the retirement accounts. They're, um, they had extra perks for senior citizens. Now, I got points for selling that account. All I did was go into the system and recode them all. But it was something that I felt I could do without feeling guilty because it was a benefit to those people to have those accounts. But at the same time, I got points for selling all those new products. So that, that's the kind of thing that I sort of had to figure out how to be able to do this and still be able to sleep at night. So if you were young doing that, and you, as you age and you get older and you move up higher through the ranks in, in a large institution, does that in, impact the way that people view their jobs? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, people literally dread getting up in the morning because of the horrible things they know they're going to have to do when they get to work. They're going to have to sell somebody a mortgage they can't afford. They're going to have to let somebody buy a more expensive car than they can afford. But does that create managerials, uh, managers who might not uh, see a problem because they succeeded using that system? No, the, the managers don't see a problem because there's this big thing that goes on in the bank. It's called the annual campaign. And it's a campaign where each branch, uh, in the usually in the springtime, they have a three-month period in which to sell the maximum number of products. And the, the winning branch, it's like a competition, and the winning branch, they get their name published in the Scotia Banker Quarterly Magazine, and the manager gets to go on a trip to the tropics somewhere the winning manager, who's ever, so start off the campaign by coming out and saying, ladies, send me south, send me south, ladies, that means sell as much as you can, Mr. I get to go to south. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Buell, uh, uh, do you have anything to say in this point as well? Then we'll turn to Mr. Diltel. Yes, the, the, the problem I see is uh, this uh, sales culture is not what employees expect when they go to the bank. They feel they're providing a, a bank service that is good for clients, and I think most Canadians do trust the banks and financial institutions. But the uh, requirements of the positions have changed into it's more of a, a retail sales outlet. Now, I've not talked to a lot of bank employees, but I've talked to a lot of financial advisors who would turn to me as a father a confessor almost because they were uh, explaining how they had taken advantage of 75-year-old widows, and they would list all of the bad things they had done. But, of course, I have no record of that, just telephone conversations. But what I do know from talking to hundreds and hundreds of people, that there is a culture that exists where people are driven to create sales. They're paid on commission, and so they do things to generate income because they have to feed their families and they're forced to do this but it's against their human nature and that is what is happening with the tellers like i have heard of, of people who've joined the bank and when they've been pushed to do things for example one young fellow uh had a client come in and he suggested that he uh get a line of credit to pay off his credit card debt so that he get control over his finances the next day, he was called in by the manager and told he shouldn't do that because the bank made more money off of credit cards than, it, than they did on line of credit. And so the, this young man uh, left the job and uh, went to work at another organization. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buell. Turning to Mr. Deltel. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Monsieur, Madame, and be welcome to your House of Commons. Uh, first of all, I would like to talk to Madame Watson. Um, I read your uh, statement and I listened to what you had to say and tell you the truth, I'm very touched by your experience. And uh, you recall how it was 40 years ago when you started your career, as you said earlier. Do you understand quite well? I can't quite hear you. 
you got the earpiece ah. in? My apologies. <laughs> Sorry for that. I'm very well recognized as a mother's guy. We cannot talk very hard, so this is why I'm, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm very discreet usually. Um, Okay, sorry, Madam Watson, it was an inside joke with my friends <laughs> of the Liberal Party. Okay, Madam Watson, well, as I said, I was very touched by your statement because, you know, we're talking about what's happened 40 years ago and uh, obviously it's still in your heart and in your skin what you had to, to, to fight for uh, 30 and 40 years ago. My first question will be, okay, you talk about your personal experience in those two uh, bank, um, finance, financial institutions. Up to your knowledge in Hamilton or elsewhere, do you know if the other financial institution had the same same way to work for the, uh, the employee? Yes, absolutely. Okay. They're all the same. Uh, do you have some chat with other people? Absolutely, yes. I chatted with people in the other financial institutions all the time, especially after we went to the Ontario uh, Central Accounting Unit, where I had to have a lot of dialogue and because of the things that I was doing, the nature of the transactions I was doing. I had to have a lot of dialogue with a lot of different branches of the different banks. And uh, you get chatting. You just get chatting about how are things in your office. And it was, it was pretty much the same story. So is that right to say that at that time it was a culture of the financial institution instead of what happened in some particular bank or oh. some no it was an overall culture because this campaign that i was talking about that was that was global i mean it wasn't just the canadian branches of scotia bank it was all of them all over the world they all had to go through this selling campaign thing every year in the spring and it was an incredibly stressful time with a, you know, every Monday morning we'd start with a sales meeting, you know, to pump you up to sell stuff, you know, and, and every day the, the manager would say, send me south, ladies, send me south, and wanted to win that prize for his branch getting the most sales. And didn't matter what you sold, investment products, credit products, accounts, anything, anything, and it became incredibly difficult, especially for somebody who I mean, I, this is a small town I lived in. I knew all these people. These are all my friends and my neighbors and my family, and they want you to ask your family to open new accounts, and sell your family products. It's incredibly demoralizing and embarrassing. And especially when you are, a, as you said, a teller. Yes. And at that time, 40 years ago, there was no ATM uh, machine or things oh, like no, that. No. We, everybody went to his, fine, to his bank every week, it's usually Thursday evening, and getting the money passing the check, getting the money, and going to the grocery store after that. So, you know, everything about everybody. Well, and, and no teller, I don't think at the time that I was hired, expects to be a salesperson, a professional salesperson. They just don't expect to have to do that. Um, so it, it became kind of a, a culture shock thing. You, you start off as a teller, doing a teller's job, and then gradually you start becoming a salesperson. Then you, become, you have sales goals, and then you have to... Even after I moved into the back office area, where I didn't have any direct customer contact, I no longer had sales goals, but I then had referral goals, which meant that I had to refer customers and ideas that I had for sales to the frontline sales staff. So I still had goals, they were different, but I still had to put up with these incredible goals. And absolutely impossible, impossible to do them. In the and as, and as you day. said in your testimony and in your document that you table uh, for us, uh, it was tough, especially when you talk about uh, the house, housing, oh. and you have to to, uh, to, uh, to to borrow money for that, and sometimes you have to, to hard sell people, and that you know they will not be able to achieve uh, the, to achieve the, uh, the borrow. Well, it's funny because I used to talk to my husband about that, and uh, when we went to get our mortgage, he was absolutely stunned at the amount that they were willing to lend us, and he said, is that right? I said, no. No, mm -hmm. we cannot afford that. That's what they want you to borrow. But no, we can't afford to borrow that. And of course, that was 1999. And I and I told him at the time, this is this is going to this the house of cards is going to fall down. That's exactly what happened. Okay. So what? This is my main question now. That was true uh, 30 to 40 years ago, but up to your knowledge, is it the same situation today? Today, it is far worse than it was back then. Far worse. Far far worse than it was back then. It just happens that we have a little street festival in my hometown of Dundas, and I was at the street festival on Saturday, and I met an old banking colleague, and she still works for the bank. She worked for the bank when, when I first started in the same branch, 
and she still works for the bank, and I told her what I, where I was coming today, and she said, oh, Sally, however bad it was back then, it is a thousand times worse now. I can barely stand it. And her husband was sitting across from her. They're sitting at a picnic table just having a hot dog during the street festival. And her husband said, you really, you really need to get this message across, that people are just, they're getting sick, they're having to take early retirement, they're having to quit. Um, they don't get any severance packages. My own husband was threatened with loss of a severance when he was entitled to one. It was, it's, it's just terrible. It, it's absolutely brutal. And she told me that it's far worse now than I could ever imagine myself, even having gone through it myself for 33 years. Thank you, madam. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deltel. Uh, Mr. Dussault, and keep in mind uh, if you have any questions for Mr. Buell on the line as well. He's not, his sign's there, but the chair is uh, by way of telecommunications. Thank you, Chair, and thank, thanks to all uh, for uh, appearing before our committee. My first question will also be about uh, sales targets, and uh, I'll, maybe what Madam Watson, uh, how do they uh, uh, decide on these targets? Uh, so who decides what is the targets like for the annual campaign? The targets are set down by, I think, head office, and it's all based on ROE, return on equity. They want to make a certain return on equity each year because that's how the banks state the profit margin and the, the value of their stocks and keeping the stockholders happy. So it's all based on ROE. Um, there is also something every year called incentive pay, and if the bank doesn't make its ROE, you don't get your incentive pay. And incentive pay is its kind of like a Christmas bonus. Um, it's usually something like 1% or 2% of your salary, something like that. Um, and if you don't get your ROE, you don't get that. That's, that's just gone. Um, also, if you don't meet your sales targets, as I say, you're threatened with the loss of your job. And, and, and that's uh, pretty tough for people who've been with the bank for 20, 25 years. And so is it different in, uh, in uh, each branch? Uh, do they set different targets, or is it like a targets for the entire country? The targets are set for the entire country. It varies from branch to branch because it would depend on how many customers that branch has and how many staff they have. So it's the size of the branch dictates what your targets are going to be. And in your experience, does the target was always uh, higher each year, year after year? I mean, going uh, on Yeah, they the, became uh, more and more unrealistic, if that's what you mean, yes. Uh, and uh, so you said there's, um, you know, rewards when uh, the manager gets to the targets? Yeah, uh, there's a reward for the manager, yes. yes. <laughs> and uh, is there consequences for those who don't uh, don't get to these targets, so the employees? Uh, yes. What kind of consequences have you uh, been well, aware of being put on a blacklist of people who can uh, will be fired at some point if they don't get uh, yes, in exactly. line with the target? Yes, exactly. Wh what you get is um, notes put in your personnel file saying that you, you didn't achieve your targets or, and you, then you get to you know, sit down with the manager and he has to say, well, how can I help you achieve your targets? But there really is no help. It's because it's impossible to do. You can't help something to do something that's just completely impossible. But they, they sort of get around it by saying, well, I've offered my help. I've offered you this. I've offered you that to make your target, your goals attainable. But they are never attainable. And maybe for Mr. Elford, uh, the, the same kind of uh, question about targets and uh, uh, in the investment uh, banking uh, investment sector, or is this also a practice to have targets of selling investment vehicles uh, and uh, like they're asking to uh, sell more and more each year and the targets are all, 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 always higher each year? I, I believe it is. Uh, just two years ago, uh, TD caused all of their, their, their grid, their commission grid payout to be adjusted so that if you were a salesman for TD Wealth Management, and if you did not produce uh, more than $2,000 a day in fees or commissions, your pay would be cut by 60%. So that's the kind of thing that happened in the last two years to every employee of the wealth management division. In my, my recollection of the policy, and it's online or it's available, it's a public policy, of just saying, okay guys, um, you either produce over $2,000 a day, I'm paraphrasing, I think it's $400,000 was the annual 
fee or commission generation that's required to be at a certain level of payout and anybody below that your old fruit you're ready for the grave your 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 fees your commissions are cut sorry your payout is cut 60 percent from what it used to be and just last year uh, two or three people that I know in my community in Scotia were uh, unceremoniously met at the office at 8 a.m. and told they no longer had jobs because they were people who weren't producing a minimum of $500,000 and that was the level across Canada and I don't know how many but I'm told it was between 50 and 100 people across Canada at Scotia. Uh, again, I don't have the details on this except for knowing of three individuals in my community that weren't producing $500,000 and were let go. And my other question was related to uh, fees. Uh, so you, you says when you sell an investment product uh, vehicles, there's fees associated to it uh, or uh, uh, compensation or uh, you know uh, other kind of uh, uh, fees. Uh, so uh, can you tell us what is the regulatory framework for setting those fees? Uh, is the client uh, supposed to know the fees and in your experience uh, uh, have you seen some instances where the clients uh, didn't know about the exact fees of those uh, investment products? Yes, uh, in many instances the fees are as opaque or as well hidden as the license of the person calling themselves an advisor. It's something that is, in, in the time that I've been in the business, the license has been kept behind the back of representatives because no one in the industry wants to tell you that I'm a salesperson. No one wants to disclose that. They say I'm a wealth manager, I'm a financial advisor, I'm a retirement specialist, I'm an elder estate planning specialist. Any name in the book to prevent me from having to say to you, I'm sorry but I'm just a salesperson and I don't have to place your interest first. So the concealment uh, applies to the fees as well and there are any, any number of ways to double charge a person, triple charge a person, churn their account so that they pay a fee today and then move their investments six months from now and they pay another fee. And the latest and the greatest trend in the banking and financial industry is to make all investment clients be put on an advisor account, advisory fees, in which they pay one or two percent extra on every dollar in every client account every day for the rest of their lives. And that would take place whether or not they even have a licensed advisor. So it's a fairly large harvest. In 2001, RBC's numbers had $35 billion under that process. A fee every day in every account for the every dollar. My, maybe my other question would be around uh, the... Uh, I know you've been uh, aware of the testimony of uh, Monday uh, with the FCAC uh, and uh, the bank. Canadian Bank Bankers Association. Uh, what is your thought about uh, the uh, Financial Consumer Agency of Canada and the way they regulate uh, and they protect consumers uh, and uh, the uh, the work that they have been done in the past? Uh, and what is your uh, uh, what is your thoughts on the, on their uh, what they said on Monday? Uh, I'm afraid my thoughts aren't very complimentary. I've been in the industry since 1984 and I hadn't really heard or seen or noticed any action by the FCAC, FCAC until this hearing. I hadn't heard that they had spoken out to protect investors at all until CBC did a program and then they looked at it. I hadn't heard that they had made any reports on banking except in 2016 they made a glowing report on the banking system and said how wonderfully it worked. Unfortunately, CBC showed that that is incorrect and that the FCAC may be one of those regulators that what we would do in Alberta, and Ron can back me up on this, we would trade the regulator for a broken-legged yellow dog. We would take the dog out to my brother Norman's farm and we would put it out of its misery. Forgive my uh, Im imagery here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, Mr. Fergus. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, and, and thank you in extent to Mr. Abdul for uh, participating over the phone. Um, I'd like to sort of explore on that aspect of things, not, not the, the vivid imagery of <laughs> Mr. Alford, but um, uh, 
So all of your testimonies all come back to the notion that there's a lot of internal pressure to achieve certain sales targets at the risk of, 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 of poor job evaluation or uh, in several cases, actual termination of employment. I want to back this up now into, uh, into another aspect. What is the effect of those that pressure on you, either on the investment side or on the teller side? Uh, what is the effect onto how you treat your customers? In other words, how do you achieve those uh, those targets to your customers? Do your customers understand what they're what products they're buying or engaging with? Do they have informed consent, or is there a really an opportunity? Is there efforts to just get to that sale? Well, personally, I did not achieve my sales goals. I didn't even try to. Um, as I said, I did this one trick where I recoded a bunch of accounts to be seniors accounts after going through everybody's profile and figuring out how old they were so that I could do that. Um, but I left the branch banking system and I went to the central accounting unit to get away from the sales targets and the sales goals. But I know a lot of people who just become terribly terribly ill. They just they just can't do it. Sure, I get that from, from the employee side. I'm trying to figure out what was the effect on the clients, on the, on the people, Canadians like me who are not in the banking industry and trust my banks, and I'm just trying to figure out, uh, you know, well, I how, think did, how, did, how did the people who did stay, yep. and not, not to yourself, but how did yep. people who did stay, how did they achieve their targets? And the other side, did they, did they force sale, force a sale onto their clients? They pretty much do force a sale onto their clients. Um, in my branch in particular, which is very close to university, they sold dozens, hundreds, hundreds of credit cards to graduate students. Graduate students shouldn't have credit cards. Most graduate students will tell you that. But they, and they gave them huge limits, like a $10,000 limit now, for a graduate student on a credit card that they didn't ask for. They just, they look on their profile, see they were a grad student, and in you come, and here's your credit. That's not a good thing. I can say that that did happen to me. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Alfred, Mr. your experience? Thank you, the good, the great question. The clients don't know that they're being harmed. The fees, commissions, trailer fees, all those things are not fairly and fully disclosed. Again, just like the license that I held when I was with the bank was not disclosed during the entire time I worked at the bank, a period of 20 years, my license and my agency duty and my duty of care. If that's concealed, then of course the methods of concealment of fees and commissions and charges is easily confusing and concealed. Uh, so clients don't know and they're happy. The definition of fraud is that when something, uh, difference between fraud and theft, fraud is that uh, something has been taken from you and you don't know about it and you're happy. Theft is something has been taken from you and you know about it and you're sad. The types of deception that we practice in the financial industry that we're able to practice are a type of fraud that no one knows about. The effects on the salesperson, the, the employees, are that they become stressed, they become put under pressure, they be I'm told that you have to abuse your clients or be abused yourself by sales targets and that kind of thing. Okay, so so that's where I'm trying to go. So I understand it in terms of the stress of the employees, but I'm trying to figure out, again, I'm trying to get down to how this plays out for ordinary Canadians who are clients of the bank. So, uh, you know, let me just tell a story. Uh, one summer, uh, my, you know, uh, I was 16 years old, I think it was, no, 17, and uh, I, uh, couldn't find a summer job. It was late in the season, so I went and joined a, a phone a telephone service for a Montreal newspaper, now defunct. Uh, and boy, we had to sell. We just had to sell. And if we sold to people who didn't speak English or French, and we got them, we got them uh, abonnement, um, uh, uh, subscriptions. Thank you. Uh, we got them subscriptions, and you know, you don't. That wasn't informed consent, but we, you know, kept a job for a couple of weeks, right? Um, is it that same kind of high pressure tactics that Canadians, again, uh, the clients of these banks, don't realize what they're getting? They're being sold products and services that they don't need and uh, have no benefit to them, no matter what cost them. Yeah. Go, please. <laughs> well, recently I went into my own bank profile 
and I found there was a, um, a MasterCard on my profile. And I didn't have a MasterCard. I'd never applied for a MasterCard. I didn't know anything about MasterCard. I had, a, I had a staff visa. So I contacted the bank and I said, why have I got this MasterCard? And they said, well, it's free. I said, I don't, I don't care. It's got a zero balance. It's never been used. Take it off my profile. Oh, but it's good for your profile. It's good for your, your credit profile for you to have that on. I said, no, no, no. I didn't apply for this MasterCard. Take it off. So <laughs> I was having a discussion with somebody earlier today who said they had had the same thing. And what it was was the bank had bought Sears credit card customer list. I'd had a Sears credit card for about three weeks, five years ago. And all of a sudden that turned into an active credit card on my Scotiabank profile. I never signed anything for it. I didn't want it. I asked them to, it took me three months for them to get it off my profile. And I asked for a written letter from the bank stating that they had put this card on my profile uh, without any of my, with my, my knowledge, without my permission, they wouldn't put it in writing. They wouldn't talk to me by email. They would only talk to me on the phone. Does uh, Mr. Buell have any comments to interject here on this point in investments? Uh, absolutely. Uh, what I'm hearing is the truth. And this is what we said to the committee. You need to talk to the witnesses to discover the truth because the good words of the regulators, uh, really, uh, those uh, rules and regulations are not applied. The problem is they're basically selling financial products. They're not advising uh, clients. They're not looking after their best interests. And this goes against uh, the feelings of most ordinary Canadians. And that is why they're distressed when they're forced to do it. Like I've talked to you know, the, the financial advisors I've talked to many by phone, and they uh, confess to me, for what it's worth, that they've resorted to alcohol, uh, alcohol and drugs to enable them to do the work they have to do to take advantage of their clients. And to me, uh, it's a, a real sociological problem when employees are treated that way. And I think it's unfortunate that we, uh, well, it is good that we're a society based on trust, but it's unfortunate that people are being forced to do things that are against uh, their inner feelings. And this creates a lot of distress in the individuals. As Sally said, it creates sickness. It creates lots of issues. And I think that's something that the committee should look at and should seriously consider uh, recommending to government that they take action immediately. George. A very short question to, to perhaps all three of you. On Monday's, at Monday's testimony that we heard from uh, the FCAC and we also heard from uh, the, the Canadian Bankers Association, they indicated that uh, the banks all have codes of conduct. They all, have, they all want to promote a, 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 an appropriate culture. Um, is it any of your experiences that you were aware of any uh, code of conduct training? or of uh, any formal uh, 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 guidelines as to how you to, to carry yourself out and that, carry out your business in an ethical way? Perhaps short answers, if you could. All right. The only codes of, codes of conduct that I recall while I was working at Scotiabank, and I've put this in my talking points, I worked there for 33 years, there was a code of conduct pertaining to customer confidentiality. Absolutely adherence to that. If not, you were fired. Totally appropriate. Um, there was a code of conduct pertaining to money laundering prevention rules. We had to sit down and watch videos every year and write tests. We were very well versed in how to prevent money laundering. There was a code of conduct about discrimination in the workplace, and, and that was also very strict. Uh, but I, rem I remember no code of conduct whatsoever when it came to how you sold your products. There may have been one. It was not something that I was ever made privy to in 33 years. I never had any training. I never had watched a video about it. We never had a meeting about it. You were simply given your goals and told to get them. Mr. Buell or Mr. Alfred? Well, uh, we've uh, recently looked at the FCAC and uh, we saw that they established rules and guidelines and then they tell the banks to self-regulate. In our experience, and talking to hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, if you listen to what the people are saying, it's contrary to what you're reading. 
in the codes of ethics and the rules and guidelines that the regulators provide. There's a great difference between the two, and uh, I tend to put uh, more credibility into what people are saying rather than what I hear from the regulators. Uh, and then turning to uh, Mr. Albus, uh, we'll go to five-minute rounds and we can get everybody on. I Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I certainly appreciate all three witnesses for your testimony here today. Um, again, this is a very important study, and I do appreciate your frank and, and honest responses. I'm just going to start first uh, with Ms. Watson. Ms. Watson, um, I actually was able to serve on a special committee for pay equity, and one of the areas under examination, obviously, was pay equity for women, but also uh, examining the federal labor standards in the federally regulated market. Uh, and uh, uh, from, from our view of it, uh, banks have really beefed up in their area around making sure people are properly compensated for any time and whatnot, and there are better mechanisms now uh, through, uh, through uh, uh, implementation of a variety of, of uh, new labor code standards. That being said, um, obviously, and I, I'm speaking I'm speak in general to, to all three, and then I'll be asking for each one of you to, to uh, voice in, Obviously, banking is, uh, there's more competition than ever. Customers, consumers can go uh, very quickly uh, from a uh, low-cost bank to a virtual bank. They can choose uh, to have a, uh, you know, if they, if they want to deal with uh, mutual funds, they can choose their own self-directed options through a separate uh, organization um, while still having the convenience of online banking. Um, and so for a lot of people, the onus is on the banks to treat their customers if they want to continue to keep them. Now, I certainly agree that there are going to be cases where um, individual cases like, for example, your MasterCard, mysterious MasterCard account, and there are codes of conduct federally put in place on uh, ensuring that there is consent and plain language used. I just really want to del delineate. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with a business offering to a client uh, an extra service. I think when you go into a car dealership, they will often try to upsell you on a feature. It's up to the individual customer to decide. Now, where I do draw the line, though, is behaviors like you mentioned, Ms. Watson, where things were unsolicited. Uh, and also, at the same token, I do think we need to examine the incentive systems and what that may have. Uh, now, the question I have for you is, Right now, I've heard some concerns how the FCAC, uh, you know, you know, they're conducting an investigation, and I'm not going to prejudice that. But some would say, who do you hold accountable? Do you hold accountable the person in your role? Do you hold accountable the manager, or do you put, you know, hold accountable the uh, upper management, as in the CEO, for the systems of compensation that are put in place, um, and uh, or do you hold uh, the directors of the company? accountable for that because I think one of the biggest challenges in my mind is you may have one employee who has figured out a way uh, to you know to increase their incentive pay or other options um, and that might not be complicit with the management or with the CEO or with the board of directors uh, so let's just start there if the system was to be improved of oversight who would you say would be first accountable the CEO Without a doubt, it would be the CEO. Mr. Alford? Uh, management, upper level, sales managers, all the way up through the system, who all have bonuses and incentives, depending on whether they're going to get sent on a trip or not, and regulators who pretend to protect Canadians when what they are doing is, is they're actually insulating the banks and investment okay. dealers from... Now, again, we have to say that many of these things we've had before, as Mr. Leifert was quite clear last time, that there are allegations we've heard on different uh, shows like Marketplace, but it's good for us to talk about these, uh, these kinds of cases um, in general terms. My, my next question is that if, uh, you know, again, when we're asking the question of, of, about individual and, and how they behave, so what you're saying, if someone is acting unethically and signing people up for accounts that they didn't sign up for or has uh, initialed uh, where, where there was no consent, to me, you would hold the person that was doing that accountable. Um, now, you say, though, that it should be the system that is held accountable for that person. What about also someone's licensing? If they are licensed in some way provincially, is there not a code of conduct 
or, or a, a, a code of ethics like other professional uh, credentialed individuals? I'd say that the answer to that is if it's a systemic wrong that's being done, if there's hundreds of employees across an institution doing wrong with forgery or signing people up things, systemic issues, in my view, are never punished because they're very profitable to sign up hundreds and thousands of clients. If it interferes with the profits of the bank, they'll punish it. If it uh, catches one bad apple, they'll punish that person. But if it's across the board systemic and profitable, that's, that's not a defense. Now, I have to say I, I do have some skepticism around mutual funds, etc., simply because when someone is dealing in investments, again, Cafe Demptor, buyer beware, um, obviously if someone uh, you know, will not purchase a stock if they do not feel that there is a, a benefit to them. Um, that being said, if someone is uh, acting maliciously, uh, you know, then, then I do believe there should be recourse for that. Uh, but I, I, I'd like to... Uh, um, um, focus back in on uh, the FCAC. You specifically said earlier that you do, no, do not think the system that, it, that they are investigating, um, there's, a, there's a, a too cozy a relationship. Can you just ex explain what you mean? And again, I do note that, th that there is absolute privilege here, Mr. Chair, but I, I really think it's important uh, that, that, that we all uh, act responsibly here in what we say. Um, so could you please just explain that comment a little bit further? I'll, I'll try. Thank you. There are a number of regulators. When I made a documentary film in 2004, Breach of Trust, The Unique Violence of White Collar Crime, I researched how many regulators, self-regulators, ombudsmen, agency bodies. I found over 100 in Canada, most of which paid are paid by the industry that they purport to regulate, and they act, in my opinion, more as insulators to the industry rather than protectors to your constituents. So they insulate the industry from being held to account for systemic issues which are highly profitable. So uh, you did mention the ombudsperson process. Uh, some banks choose to have an in-house ombudsperson uh, that they can. Obviously there are you know, some firewalls put in place. Uh, others choose to use a third party ombudsman uh, and that information we've heard from the FCAC is directly shared with them. Do you have any suggestions about how that process could be improved, or do you think enough people know about the, their rights uh, to use an ombudsperson? Good question. I think that makes my point. The ombudsman was giving recommendations that were fairly favorable and fair to clients on settlements. So um, Royal Bank and TD walked away from them, summarily firing the ombudsman, saying we will not deal with them, despite agreeing that we have to deal with the banking ombudsman. They went out and hired their own, and that is the exact example of hiring another layer of a quasi-regulator to insulate yourself from harm and accountability. Hire your own people, and within a year, the Ombudsman OBSI, which was doing a good job, was told that you shall not look at systemic issues, you shall not investigate them, and you shall not touch them. So the issues that are costing Canadians billions and billions of dollars, not one bad apple, not one get bad guy in Mississauga, the systemic issues that cost every Canadian across the board, you shall not look. That's my strongest message. Thank you, uh, Dan, I hate to cut to the, but you're double over time. I thought we should let that line of questioning go, uh, Mr. Severa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and welcome everyone, and Stan, welcome on the line. Um, I'm gonna just ask two, two questions, and then you can uh, please feel free to answer in the manner you feel appropriate. Uh, first of all, uh, with regards to FCAC, uh, they have announced a full review or of, of the business practices by the banks and um, or federally regulated institutions to be technically correct. And I would like to know what would you individually like to see come out of that review? That's part one of my question. And the second question is uh, financial, li financial literacy. Uh, we now have the month of November is Financial Literacy Month here uh, in Canada. Uh, we have we have a member in our caucus who's uh, championing championing this, and I applaud her efforts. Uh, we always also have the province of Ontario adopting, beginning in uh, September 2018, uh, a requirement uh, for high school students to undertake financial literacy in high school. Uh, so I wanted to take hear your take on that because I think there is a uh, an education process that needs to go on with consumers in terms of financial products that uh, probably I, I feel for a long time has not occurred. Um, you know, I'll give you an example, and you can get a mutual fund and you'll be charged an MER 
uh, or you can buy an exchange traded fund. Most people don't know an exchange traded fund is much cheaper to own and, and, uh, and your returns uh, will be compounded much quicker uh, if you buy an exchange traded fund from, from, you know, from a financial institution versus a, a mutual fund. Um, so on the, on the financial literacy component and also on the broad review that FCAC is coming out, uh, is undertaking, uh, what are your comments on those two? And e each individual, please answer. I'm not familiar with the FCAC broad review, so I can't comment to that. But I can comment to the financial literacy part, and I think that there are just so many products being offered by the banks now, it is virtually impossible to educate the public on all of these different products, especially when the products themselves keep changing in nature. And nobody gets nobody gets a, a something in the mail or something in their email saying, oh, by the way, we've changed the interest rate on this, or we've changed the service charge structure on that, or we've changed the minimum balance requirement. Uh, those things just don't go out to the public. You would have to retrain yourself on all these products every six months in order to keep up. I just, I, I, like I also worked at the same financial institution that you worked at, Ms. Watson, Ms. Watson, so I, I'm familiar not on the retail side, but on the other side. I, I do believe that the banks do send out and are required to send out, and, and, and if I'm mistaken, I'll excuse myself, when they are, there are changes to service fee structures, customers are informed. Like, there is, there is, inf there is uh, information that is sent out to the customers when, say, a minimum balance uh, check or a bounce check, or for example, service charges, when those changes are made, the banks do inform their customers. I'm familiar with the, the information you provided on taking courses on money laundering and, and so forth. I've had to take this, the same courses that you had to take. We take bank wide, and, mm -hmm. and you know, they're, they're informative, and, and, and I, I agree with you. But I, the bank's customers are informed of the changes that take place with regards to service fee changes in the products that they have. That, that, I, that I'm, I'm very well aware of. Well, it, it doesn't happen to me. I've been a bank customer for 41 years, and I have not had any information from the bank regarding any of my products. Now, with some of them being flagged as staff, they don't incur service charges because I did officially retire from the bank, so I don't pay that many service charges. But there are other st structural account changes that take place that I am never informed of. Do, can you have any comments on the financial literacy component, please? Further comments? The financial literacy yep. component? You mean getting the the public to understand all the ins and outs of all their financial products? Yes. Okay. Well, I guess the only way to really, for a person to really be well informed is they have to do everything through a financial advisor. So they have to go into the branch, make an appointment, go in, sit down with that person in order to get all the, the information that they need to make an informed decision. But at the same time, that financial advisor has the pressure to sell them things they don't need. So. And, they, and they, they trust the financial advisor. They trust their advice. And sometimes it's very bad advice indeed. I hear you uh, a moment ago tried to come in. Uh, yes, I'd like to make a general comment on this uh, investor education. Uh, as has been said, the industry is complex. Regulatory system is complex. There's a myriad of product out there and really, people do need somebody to advise them. What we do need is we need advisors that can be trusted because the regulators claim to be protecting investors. Most Canadians believe they can trust the industry. And in reality, it really is investor beware. But people cannot learn enough about investing to really be able to protect themselves and make all the decisions. They need financial advice. I think government must recognize that, and they must ensure that the people who are giving advice are qualified to give the advice and are held accountable. That's what I think is needed. Uh, thank you uh, all. We're over in that round, too. Mr. Leipert. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. When you get down to this end of the table, uh, a lot of the questions have been asked and answered, so I've only got a couple of brief questions, so I'll give you back some of the time my... Uh, colleagues so inappropriately ate up. I'll, uh, uh, Mr. Alford, uh, I think I heard you say something to the effect that you had no confidence in in-house investigations, if I heard that correctly. Now, uh, would you consider the FCAC 
review of this an in-house investigation? No, I don't know that I'm extremely familiar with what the FCAC is, is able to do, but in response to that, um, I have not seen anything from 1984 to 2017, nor including Monday's testimony, that gives me confidence that the FCAC, and to answer your question uh, previous, confidence that they even understand or address that there is a systemic issue that costs Canadians more than uh, uh, all the crime in the land. Page four of my submission shows one example where $100 million was removed from investors' pockets, $100 billion, sorry, in one case of a systemic issue out of 14,000 such cases that research has come up. One case removes $100 billion, and I don't see the FCAC, FCAC even uh, aware of those kind of systemic issues, I'm shocked. Well, I would hope they would be. I mean, that's kind of their job. Uh, they would be, too. Now, I'd ask Mr. Buell if you could comment on that. Uh, you are... If I uh, understand correctly, you are a consumer versus an employee of the bank or ex-employee of the bank, uh, representing a consumer organization. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. So the the FCAC should be uh, shouldn't have any difficulty uh, looking into your allegations. Well, uh, we have focused on the security uh, industry simply because uh, most Canadians own mutual funds. And as Larry has pointed out, uh, people are losing billions of dollars investing in mutual funds. And the problem in Canada is we don't have one single regulator. In Quebec, they're a bit closer to the truth because they, they uh, have one regulator that clients or customers can go to. In Canada, we have 13 provincial regulators for securities, and uh, so uh, we do have a secretariat in Montreal, but they will refer people to the provincial regulators. So there's no one source they can go to. But the real problem is the industry is based on selling product, and that is getting into the banks now where they're based on selling product. Rather than being a trusted organization that customers can go to and expect that they will get the best advice. And that's the fundamental problem. They're selling products instead of helping customers by give, giving them sound advice. And I think one of the challenges we have as a committee is, we, you know, we, we hold a hearing, we listen to all of the testimony, uh, and this is no disrespect to what uh, we're about to hear, but I'm probably expecting to hear when the banks come before the committee that uh, yes we've investigated some of these uh, concerns there were some situations where there were some uh, these are my words not theirs but bad apples in the in the system we've uh, dealt with that and uh, it doesn't happen today so that's I think part of the challenge we're going to have uh, as a committee is uh, trying to figure out you know it's 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 the old he said she said situation and we sort of are kind of stuck in the middle, and that's why I guess I would hope that the uh, the ongoing investigation by the FCAC could get more to the bottom of it than we as a parliamentary committee could. So I think that's about all I had, Mr. Th Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Leipert. Uh, Ms. O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for being here. Mr. Buell, or Buell, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, but um, my question is first for you. I have actually read some of the reports on your uh, association's website. I have above the law in front of me that report, um, and I'm the issue of financial advisor, advisor, O or an E, uh, came up. Uh, myself and, and my colleague asked questions about this with the FCAC, and granted the FCAC doesn't regulate in the uh, investment side. However, there was a comment made along the lines, and I'm definitely paraphrasing because I don't have the exact testimony in front of me, but that regardless of the spelling of the word, that if, there, if the employee is acting in a regulated way, so for example, if they're selling some type of investment, regardless of their title, they fall under the regulation. And that is not what we've heard or read about in certain things. Do you have any comment on that? 
Well, if the rules and regulations were followed, and if the codes of ethics were adhered to, I would not see much of a problem that are made available to the public. So they believe they can put their trust in these financial institutions. But the reality is people are losing billions of dollars every year when they place their trust in these institutions. And that is why I've recommended that the committee listen to some witnesses. And what I think should result is uh, the committee should be making a recommendation to the government that they have a public inquiry and not just to listen to one or two or half a dozen witnesses, listen to hundreds. Like, I believe, I know from talking to thousands of people, both within the industry, within the regulators, and the public. I just talked to a 75-year-old gentleman who's learning to use the Internet, and now he's finding out information like he had a line of credit for $70,000 that he took out to help his son years ago. He goes into the bank and says, I don't use this line of credit anymore. I don't need it anymore, and I want to cancel it because it's showing up on my uh, my home uh, as a, uh, an obligation. But I have no mortgage on my house, and I don't need this line of credit. I want to cancel it. The bank says, okay, but there's a $200 fee to cancel this unused line of credit. Thank you. And there's this, is this, oh, is this also one of the other concerns that we, from the, um, from the side of the average Canadian and, and where to turn or where to get answers, is this where your recommendation, oh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a national consumer regulate, regulator that would, all the different silos um, that exist that are, uh, and we heard testimony too that are uh, constitutional issues in terms of jurisdiction, um, but that if there was some national kind of oversight to ensure that there is your suggestion to ensure that the regulators, and we heard from Mr. Elford, that the regulators are actually regulating what they're supposed to be regulating. Well, I'm not arguing against the different silos for regulation. What I am saying is I believe the government of Canada should be responsible for the welfare of all Canadians. And I feel they should have responsibility to ensure that all Canadians are protected. And that uh, agency or authority... should work with all the different silos of regulation. And it's not to replace them, but just to protect Canadians, because too many people are losing their savings. Thank you. And then if I have time, Mr. Alford, uh, a couple of things. One, you mentioned this TD policy around the $2,000 a day in fees, and you said it's public. I did a quick Google search. I couldn't find it. If you have access, would you be able to send that to the clerk just for our reference? I, Thank yes, you. I would. And then in addition to that, um, I guess one of the, the questions or concerns I think about, just even as myself or my family members, someone going into a bank, one of the reasons you might go to one of the larger banks if you have access, and I know in some communities you don't, and that's where credit unions for sure come into play. But when we're talking about banks specifically, there is a level of trust and protection that when you put your money in, you know, relatively speaking, it, you're going to be able to get it out when you need it. And the concern, it's almost, um, is it almost a, an unfair advantage in the sense of this trust around protection of of funds, right? Insurance that your funds are going to be there. So in terms of uh, maybe Canadians who decide not to invest through a large bank, but then what protections do they have? And I know I was doing some research, there's the Canadian Protection Investor Fund. However, it goes back to kind of that literacy. How do Canadians really know what their options are? Or do they just feel that the banks are the only option and those fees are just part of doing business, and if they want to be investors, even small-time investors, then that's the options they're left with. Is Mr. Alford, like, this is just something I'm 
grappling with in terms of what would the average Canadian experience uh, for someone like yourself who might have, you know, dealt with clients and things like that. Is that a, a fair kind of assumption that some Canadians would worry about? Thank you. Canadians are led to believe by advertising, marketing, promises, and uh, every message out there that they should go and see a financial advisor and they should trust the advice of that advisor. And if they have altering life events, they should check with their financial advisor. And the fact is that there are 120,000 licensed registered dealing representatives found in Canada on the Canadian Securities Administrator's search page today. <clears throat> There are only 4,000 licensed advisors in Canada on that same search page. So that all salespersons in the country, including when I worked in the industry, were pretending to be financial advisors. Most salespersons don't even know that because they've never held their license in their hand. I've never seen a copy of a financial salesperson license nor a financial advisor license, despite working in the industry for 20 years. Um, So it is like trusting, it's like asking uh, 10 million Canadian people, the average number of investors in the population, to trust a doctor who's not a doctor, but he did take a St. John's first aid course, St. John's ambulance. That's what the banking industry does is by saying, it's a bait and switch saying, trust our advisors, and the banks are pushing salespeople at their customers as hard as they can push, 120,000 versus 4,000. That's a lot of push salespersons, and they all have to push product. They have to push product. Achieve or leave. Achieve or leave was the letter I got in 1980s. Achieve or leave. And that letter was given to my former associates at Scotia McLeod last year. Achieve or leave. Thank you uh, both. Uh, Mr. Dussel, about two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I want to come back to uh, something I asked uh, Monday about uh, the concept of name and shame, uh, about uh, w when banks are uh, are found guilty of uh, anything, uh, and that uh, the FCAC should more often name the uh, uh, faulty bank. Um, and. Uh, if I take the uh, food uh, sector, if uh, the, the, you know, the last thing you want is to be named as a bad uh, company and uh, uh, having to recall some products, uh, or if you're in the, in the auto sector, you don't want also those kinds of things and your name being uh, in paper, in the uh, newspapers. Uh, so do you think uh, this would be one of the solution uh, to, to us uh, for recommendations? to be, uh, well, doing more investigations, be more uh, thorough in those investigations, and also at the end of the day, uh, make sure that the, bank, the, the, the banks that are not acting in the best interest of consumers are named, and people know who they are, and uh, they can choose which banks they will do business with uh, in light of these uh, these investigations. Mr. Alford, Madam Watson. Please. Thank you, I'll be brief. Uh, in, since 1984, I've never seen the FCIC name and shame anyone. And in fact, until I heard about this committee, I'd never heard of the FCIC doing much of anything. Uh, the off official banking ombudsman, OBSI, uh, did name and shame uh, companies, and they did get their knuckles wrapped for doing that, and certain companies unilaterally fired them and said, we will not deal with the official banking ombudsman and they went out and hired their own referees who gave more favorable opinions and did not name and shame. That's the example of the double bind that the regulators are put in. It's exactly the example that the employees, bank employees are put in. Either do what we say or else you're fired. And the official banking ombudsman was neutered, effectively fired, and the FCA, CF, whatever they are, excuse me, 
uh, steps in as if they could or would do that. I'm 33 years waiting. Thank you. And maybe the, my last question will be around the, the culture, uh, Madam Watson, in your experience. Uh, uh, is the culture, is it, the culture in banks is really what the Skinners and Bankers Association said uh, uh, that clients were all, always in, the, the, uh, in front of, of anything before profit even. Uh, uh, and what is the culture, so uh, in your opinion, in banks? Is it uh, uh, profit before anything else or is it uh, serving clients before anything else? No, it is absolutely profit before anyone else. It is, certainly has nothing to do with servicing clients as, as far as I could tell from the decades that I spent with Scotiabank. Um, I, I also think this name and shame, it's, it's starting to happen because I don't think any of us would be sitting in this room here if it weren't for Wells Fargo Bank and the employees at Wells Fargo finally coming forward and telling their story. I think that's what got the Canadian um, bank employees to come forward and start telling their stories to the CBC. And I found out it by, because I, I'm a news hawk, I watch the CBC all the time and I read it online and that's how I found about this, this commission. Um, and I thought, well, that's interesting because we're talking about things that have, all these people are talking about things that happened in the last five to ten years. So I got in touch with the, the CBC reporter and said, I can tell you that I was doing that 40 years ago. And she found that to be quite shocking. I think what's shocking is how long this has been going on without anybody ever making a fuss about it. And I think it's time a fuss was made. And that's why I think this is, commission is a great thing. Uh, okay. Uh Thank you. I, uh, <laughs> I'm going to come back to uh, Mr. Leipert's uh, question, actually. The, uh, uh, and this is a committee, not a commission, uh, Sally. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's one of the difficulties that some of her, us are grappling with, is, is what uh, really can we do at the end of the day? Um, I think... Uh, uh, a little over a year ago, the government tried to uh, put uh, consumer protection from a federal standpoint into, uh, I believe it was into the budget, I forget which bill it was, uh, and had to pull it back because of, uh, as I think you said, Mr. Alford, there's 13 different systems in the country, and did we have the constitutional authority to do that? Uh, so that's a dilemma. So I'd ask... Uh, uh, all three of you, uh, Mr. Buell and uh, PEI as well, uh, do you have any suggestions on what, uh, on where the federal government, if we're to make a recommendation, uh, where the federal government should go on this matter? Start with you, Mr. Buell. Well, as I said many years ago, I could not see a national regulator happening in Canada. Uh, and I still feel that way. I don't have the solution for it. I had hoped that the government might be able to take action to protect Canadians in working with the established regulatory silos. Uh, there's uh, no quick solution, but I, I do think a public inquiry is in order. Right now, due to CBC Go Public, we have learned, Canadians have learned more about what's going on than they ever knew before. And we're seeing the feedback we get from the public is they are becoming more aware. And I believe government must act. It's not enough to rely 